Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday Forum of the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dick Pogue, a former president of the City Club, and it's my great privilege today to introduce our speaker, Irshad Manji. Mrs. Manji has provoked a fierce reaction really around the world with her provocative calls for reform of Islam, a religion of which she is a devout member. She's broadened her philosophy in recent years beyond Islam to become a critic of the so-called politics of moderation, or as she calls it, groupthink, which she describes in what she calls these times of moral crisis. This broadened philosophy in turn has led her, had, uh, led her in 2008 to start a movement called the Moral Courage Project. This is an activity which she <coughs> uh, advances from her current teaching position at New York University. She defines moral courage as the willingness to speak truth despite disapproval from one's own community. Everyone, not just Muslims, she says, should speak truth to power when they see abuses in their own communities. Ms. Maji grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Her parents were of Egyptian and Indian heritage. The family had emigrated to <coughs> Canada from Uganda during Idi Amin's 1972 purge of the country's Indian minority. And this was said to have been a traumatic uh, experience of Muslims brutalizing other Muslims. When she was in Vancouver as a young student, she was kicked out of her Islamic school by the imam for asking too many questions. And she did a lot better in the more open environment of the Vancouver public school system, where she felt free to make open inquiries in the uh, schoolroom. Her first book was published in 2004. And the title of it is The Trouble with Islam Today, A Muslim's Call for Reform in Her Faith. It was so impactive that she received death threats in the aftermath of the publication of that book. Her second book was published last year. It also had a long title, Allah, Liberty, and Love, The Courage to Reconcile Faith and Freedom. And this was based on the Quran's uh, precept of something she may mention called the Ijihad, the right to think independently. Mrs. Maji asserts that the Quran contains three times as many verses which promote critical thought as opposed to blind submission. In Indonesia, the Jakarta Post is the major newspaper there. And of course, Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim country. And that uh, <clears throat> paper has characterized her as one of three women who are creating positive change in contemporary Islam. And by the way, the City Club's in good company. After today's presentation, she leaves for London, where she's going to be addressing the House of Lords. Today, Irshad Maji speaks to us on the subject, America and Islam, Challenges Ahead. Now, today we're going to be following a format which we used recently at the City Club when uh, many of you are here to hear Jim Tomey and, and uh, Tom Hamilton. That is, rather than give a formal speech, she will answer questions put to her by one of her local colleagues here in the Cleveland area, Dr. Lee Makala. Uh, Lee taught uh, Japanese and Chinese history at Cleveland State University for over 40 years, and he's well known to many of you here in the audience. So with great admiration, I present Urshad Manjim. <laughs> Ershad, welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. And, and before we get to our conversation, Lee, if I may quickly say to the audience, this is how important Cleveland is to me. Uh, Dick mentioned that uh, a few days from now I'll be speaking at the House of Lords. What he was too modest to mention is that um, I rescheduled the House of Lords in order to make it to Cleveland. <laughs> The Brits can wait. 
I also very quickly, before we jump into the dialogue, want to uh, make a couple of introductions and thanks as well. One is to a staffer who is based here in Cleveland, a staffer with the Moral Courage Project, integral to representing the Moral Courage Project nationally, and he's one of your own. His name is William Green. Please stand up. Great. Thank you. Both. And I can't resist also pointing to the table just behind the front, the Moral Courage Cleveland group, which I have to tell you is the very first regional group that has emerged from the Moral Courage Project. So thank you, everybody, at that table. <laughs> Setting a trend, you pioneers. Setting a trend. Emily, thank you. You're a member of the Moral Courage Group, and I want you to sock it to me. Okay. All right. <laughs> You've come to Cleveland as a moral reformer, uh, a Muslim, uh, a teacher, and, and a number of different capacities. And as Dick outlined, you have a very interesting and complex backstory. Can you elaborate a little bit about how all of that comes together? Yeah. Well, um, I'll tell you a couple of things that Dick already mentioned, but it's worth refreshing your memory about. So I was born in 1968 uh, in the East African country of Uganda uh, to parents of Indian and Egyptian heritage, Muslim, all of us. And uh, in 1972, uh, the military dictator, General Idi Amin, booted us out of Uganda. Why? Because, if you can believe it, uh, we were not dark-skinned enough for him. Which is to say that at that time, decolonization was happening throughout Africa. And the, uh, the, the slogan of decolonization was, Africa for the blacks. Well, we weren't black. We also weren't white, and therefore not in good stead with the British. <laughs> and we really had nowhere else to go. Um, and then uh, Canada opened its doors. And uh, boy, what talk about lucking out and uh, winding up in a free and pluralistic and open society. I grew up just south of Vancouver uh, in a diverse suburb called Richmond. And that's where I attended two types of schools. Uh, the regular secular public school of most North American kids, Monday through Friday. And on top of that, every Saturday for several hours at a stretch, the madrasa or the madrasa, as it's sometimes pronounced here, the Islamic religious school. And that's where I began asking seemingly simple, but apparently inconvenient questions. Like, why can't Muslims take Jews and Christians as friends? Because that's what our teacher was telling us, that we could not do that. And that contradicted the reality, my reality, in a public school where people of all kinds of backgrounds engaged with one another to the point where I will add uh, one of my most cherished memories was uh, the conversations that I would have in, um, in high school with uh, my evangelical Christian vice principal. Never shoved his theology down my throat and always engaged me as an equal rather than as some kind of inferior. It was beautiful. And uh, by no means am I suggesting that's what all evangelicals do. I assure you I, I don't make that statement. But my point simply is that in a secular public setting, it is possible to be frank and open with one another in a way that is respectful, which means challenge me, not don't challenge me, but challenge me. And that's exactly what this vice principal did with me and I with him. That said, um, over the years, I had many, many questions, as you know, about why Islam practices what it does. And uh, having been kicked out of the madrasa at the age of 14, I had to repeatedly remind my own mother, God bless her, that ma, just because I've left the madrasa does not mean I've left Allah. Big, important distinction. She didn't buy it <laughs> at that time. Anyway, I began studying Islam on my own at the public library. This was the pre-internet days. Students, there was such a thing as pre-internet days. And, uh, and that's when I learned some fascinating things about Islam that I'd never had a hope in hell of learning at the madrasa. For example, the Prophet's beloved first wife, Khadija, was a wealthy self-made merchant for whom the Prophet worked for many, many years. She was his boss. Moreover, at 15 years older than he was, she's the one who proposed marriage to him. 
Now, if women, girls in madrasas, learned those sort of facts about Islamic history, I dare say that there would be uh, an understanding of their dignity as human beings. And perhaps that's why it's not more often taught than it is. Mm. Um, and I began to write about the need for reform among my fellow Muslims. Nobody listened. This was pre-9-11. Non-Muslims would say to me, well, that's fine, but that has nothing to do with us. That's what you people do over there. And Muslims would say to me, stop washing our dirty laundry in the front yard. Then 9-11 happened. And people, far more than before, understood that what happens within the world of Islam affects countless lives outside the fold. That is why this is a public conversation, not an internal conversation only for Muslims. And uh, the, uh, I, I wrote an editorial called uh, A Muslim Plea for Introspection uh, in a newspaper. And it got so much response, positive and negative, that it convinced me I needed to write the book, The Trouble with Islam Today, a no-nonsense uh, open letter to my fellow Muslims, in which I'm saying, look, we Muslims are the trouble with Islam today. But we can also draw inspiration from the Quran to reform our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. And we, that began a book tour which became a 10-year global conversation. As uh, Dick mentioned, uh, hate mail poured in, death threats did too. But I'm happy to report that at the same time, I would hear from younger Muslims who said things like, Irshad, millions of us think like you, but are afraid to go public with our views. And those conversations led to the question, why? What are you afraid of? And then came responses to me that then became, Irshad, tell us how. You don't need any more to tell us why we need to stick our necks out for a reformation within Islam. Show us how. How, for example, do I cope with the um, accusation that I'll be dishonoring my parents and my family when I speak my truth to them? How do I cope with the backlash that I'll be getting from my community as you're getting from yours? And during this time, PBS approached me about turning the trouble with Islam today into a documentary, which I subsequently did called Faith Without Fear, and that led to an invitation by NYU to screen the documentary and be interviewed by none other than Leslie Stahl about courage. Well, that event, Lee, was seminal in uh, the history of the School of Public Service at NYU because they realized there is so much engagement to be done with Americans on these issues that they then asked me to join the faculty at NYU uh, to teach what Robert F. Kennedy called moral courage. And as Dick very helpfully uh, mentioned to you, but I will do so again, moral courage, as Kennedy defined it, is the willingness to speak truth to power within your own community for a greater good. I didn't realize that such a phrase existed when I wrote The Trouble with Islam today. I learned that in the journey to the new book. And so for the last three years, I've been at New York University teaching moral courage, through the Moral Courage Project, and at the same time, writing my new book, Allah, Liberty, and Love, which is a how-to, not a why-to. And it shows both Muslims and non-Muslims what we must do together in order to move beyond the stonings of women and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the abuses against religious minorities and the hangings of gays and lesbians in the world of Islam. And as we do that, may we also be asking questions of our own about our communities and what we can do within those communities to bring out the better angels among all of us. With, one, with respect to your first book, the <clears throat> title of which is The Trouble with Islam Today, I wonder, as an historian of culture, right. uh, where there are standards and institutions, and then there are the practitioners of those institutions and standards, right. uh, they don't necessarily always agree. Why you didn't title it The Trouble with Muslims today? Well, it's an interesting question, and it's certainly a major criticism that I've gotten from fellow Muslims. No, Irshad, it's not the trouble with Islam today. It's the trouble with us Muslims. Yes, 
But these same Muslims, as I have pointed out to them, I'm telling no tales out of school here, I pointed out to them that they would be the first to have my dissident derriere in the courts if I had uh, uh, entitled the book The Trouble with Muslims Today. Mm -hmm. Because moderate Muslims at organizations like CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, would have been the first to say, you see, she is fear-mongering against an identifiable group of people. So on the one hand, they want the title, but on the other hand, they don't want the responsibility to own the consequences of what the trouble within Islam is today. So you don't see Muslims then as part of a homogeneous group? Oh, not at all. Not at all. But, but let me be very clear about something. Um, you know, in this country, we tend to stumble over ourselves to make the distinction between the good guys, the moderate Muslims, and the not so good guys, really the bad guys, the religious extremists. I don't think that that's the right distinction, ladies and gentlemen. Moderates are part of the problem, not part of the solution. You know, moderate Muslims today are so consumed by Western imperialism that they have distracted themselves from dealing with the imperialism within Islam. Religious extremists who for the last 75 years have killed and maimed and raped and tortured more Muslims than any foreign power has. And why do moderate Muslims deny this or dismiss it? Because they are steeped in uh, what Dick helpfully also called groupthink. They are steeped in a group identity so that speaking out becomes selling out. And to be fair, moderate Muslims are not the only people who've ever had this problem, <laughs> right? In the 1960s, many moderate Christians opposed the activism of Martin Luther King Jr. He was too extreme for them. And MLK shot back to them that in times of moral crisis, which American Christianity was in two generations ago, and which world Islam is in today, in times of moral crisis, moderation is a cop-out because it cements the status quo. He explained as well that rooting out deep corruption can never be an act of moderation. It is by necessity an intense act of love. Love for your community, first and foremost, because you're saying to them, I have faith that you're capable of better than even your own so-called leaders are giving you credit for. How would you then challenge the notion of moderation within the Islamic community? What does that group mm -hmm. need to do instead? What are some of the yeah. challenges that they face? Well, I've pointed out already that uh, moderate Muslims need to be pushed, by the way. They're not going to do it on their, on their own. They need to be pushed by citizens in wider society to own the consequences of, for example, the religious extremism that's happening within Islam. Now, you may say, well, but that's not their fault. Well, they're letting the religious extremists get away with it by never coming back to the extremists with competing bold reinterpretations of the Qur'an. For example, there's a passage in the Qur'an, chapter 5, verse 32, which states, if you kill a human being, it is like killing all of mankind, yes, but there's an escape clause, ladies and gentlemen, and you will never hear this from moderates. The escape clause is this, if you kill a human being, it is like killing all of mankind, unless you are killing that human being as punishment for murder or other villainy in the land. That clause, beginning with the word accept, gives the terrorists an out. They can define anything they wish as punishment for what America and Israel do, namely villainy and murder in the land. Okay? Moderates will always tell you, oh, the Quran is very clear. No, no, no. If you kill a human being, it's like killing all of mankind you all now have the knowledge to say, wait a minute, there's more to it than that. And I'm not saying, therefore, remember, I'm a faithful Muslim, I'm not saying, therefore, that there's no hope and you just need to nail these suckers to the wall. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you need to be pushing moderate Muslims to come up with reinterpretations of verses like that. And a crystal clear reinterpretation would be that if it's true, 
that you can kill for murder or villainy in the land, then we need to ask who is doing the murdering and the villainizing in the land. And as I just mentioned, by factual data, it is Muslims who are doing this to one another. Therefore, moderates need to come up with a roadmap to resist the oppression that's going on within Islam by Muslims. But you've mentioned the notion of interpretation. Yes. Is it possible to interpret the Quran? I just reinterpreted one of those ver very verses. What moderates do, rather than reinterpret, reinterpret, excuse me, is they deny that these verses even exist. And if you read either of my books, and I hope you read both, you will have the knowledge you need to see that, in fact, not only are moderates falling down on the job, but that it is also the responsibility and opportunity of non-Muslims to get involved in pushing moderates to go further than just you know, denial. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that Martin Luther King Jr., he himself needed atheists, white people, feminists, uh, Jews clasping arms with him in order to move American society forward. The Jewish Enlightenment in the 18th century, late 18th century of Germany couldn't happen without wider society also supporting those reformers within Judaism. And today we see, with very few exceptions, a wonderful level of integration uh, uh, of Jews in wider societies around the world. So it's not reinterpretation that will happen magically, Lee. The good citizens of Cleveland need to be part of the process of pushing moderates to get there. And that means, by the way, not worrying that you'll be offending. You will be offending. Make no mistake about that. But give me one instance, you're a historian, give me one instance in which social progress has ever happened, ever, anywhere, without feathers being ruffled. How do we get beyond the notion, though, of simply talking about change? Mm -hmm into actually doing something about it. Does the Moral Courage Project have anything to do with that? Well, I consider this initiative, the Moral Courage Project, to be the uh, new chapter of this uh, reform effort. And by the way, before I forget to say this, when I say reform effort, please don't view me as a solitary voice. Already in this auditorium, I have uh, embraced uh, a fellow Muslim, I call him my brother, he calls me his sister, reformist Muslim who is part of a worldwide emerging movement of reformers, not moderates, reformists, who are calling for human rights to be reconciled with the practice of Islam. What the Moral Courage Project does is it, it gives an intellectual understanding to why what we are doing is not evil, in fact, it is necessary. And remember, when we go back to what uh, Robert F. Kennedy said, moral courage is the willingness to speak truth to power within your community for a greater good. He was saying that, by the way, in the context of apartheid. He went to South Africa in 1966 and spoke with white students about why they need to rise up against legislated segregation between blacks, whites, and in the middle, coloreds, so-called. Okay? I'm saying that just as racial segregation needed to end in South Africa as it needed to end in America, so gender segregation now needs to end within the world of Islam. Because that segregation, if allowed to continue, leads to myriad and heinous crimes, both against girls and against boys. And again, we don't have the time to connect all of those dots right now, but those dots are connected in my books in a big picture way that people can understand. So in order not to make this simply an issue about Islam, but rather about human rights, the universality of human rights, I needed Robert F. Kennedy's concept in order to show that Muslim reform is an element of moral courage. But you, in each of your communities, may also be observing abuses of power that you're not sure if you have the backbone, the permission, the opportunity, the obligation to expose and do something about. The Moral Courage Project exists to empower you to do so, not just through the courses that I teach at NYU, but also through the media that we do, social and otherwise, 
public events that we hold, the writings that we do, uh, and I will, I'm happy to tell you uh, the next big chapter of the Moral Co Courage Project is a web-based TV channel that will profile morally courageous individuals all around the world in order to show ordinary people that it truly is possible to speak truth to power. Now, how do you, in all of this, uh, reach your audience of younger Muslims? Well, um, I have to say that young Muslims actually taught me how to reach them. Uh, after the trouble with Islam Today came out, and because of the burst of international publicity it received, my email inbox overflowed with um, emails from young Muslims in the Middle East, first and foremost, asking me, when are you going to get the book translated into Arabic so we can share these ideas with our friends? And my standard, thoroughly uh, unimaginative response to them was, please, name one Arab publisher in this fragile post-9-11 moment that'll have the guts to translate a book like this, let alone uh, publish and circulate it. And to their credit, most of these kids wrote back to say, mm-hmm, you're right, so what? Irshad, you get the book translated into Arabic, then post that translation on your website as a PDF so that it can't be hacked and tricksters can't change your words around. And when we can download it that way, free of charge, <laughs> they're young, but they're not born yesterday. <laughs> when we can download it that way, we will create the opportunities to share these ideas with our friends. We won't just download it, We'll then photocopy it and circulate it. And I have to tell you, Lee, I was rather um, skeptical about the idea at first, but what, what the heck? Gave it a shot. In just over five years, we've had more than 2.5 million downloads of a 200 plus page document in Arabic, Urdu, which is spoken in Pakistan, and Farsi, which is spoken in Iran, where of course, surprise, my books are banned outright. Okay? But the point is that digital media and social media have made it a fascinating time to be a reformist Muslim. And that's why the Moral Courage Project is now venturing into the bonanza of creating its own web-based TV channel. Now, as part of the whole of this uh, conversation, uh, we're concentrating not just on reform within Islam, but the ways in which Americans Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and non-Muslims mm -hmm. can participate in all of this. Yeah. How do they fit into the Moral Courage Project in your eyes? Right. First and foremost, um, non-Muslims, if I may call Jews and Christians and many others that, non-Muslims, um, need to understand that it is both a right and a responsibility to speak up against abuses of power that are happening in other people's cultures and not just your own. Why do I say this? Because you and I both know that we live in a time when people are told, if you don't represent, meaning skin color, okay, very superficial, if you don't represent, you can't comment. Really? Is that what we say in America to Muslims in Europe and Muslims in the Middle East when they criticize US foreign policy? That you can't comment if you don't live in America because you don't understand our culture, you don't understand our people? We never say that. We might disagree. Many of us do disagree with their criticisms, but we never say you don't have a right. Similarly, I'm asking all of you, don't swallow the lie that you don't have a right to comment. You have, in fact, an obligation to, because as I mentioned before, this is the most public of public conversations given that your lives are affected by what happens in the world of Islam. I want to bring it back to one of my heroes, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, most people don't realize this, so it's Burr's uh, uh, instruction. Uh, he was actually accused of being an, quote, outside agitator. And it was Christians in Alabama who accused this son of Georgia, Dr. King, of being an outside agitator because he dared to bring the civil rights movement across state lines from Georgia into Alabama. And the Alabama Christians who spoke out against him said, you don't understand our people. You don't understand our culture. How dare you? You have no right to comment. And King wrote back in his now famous letter from a Birmingham jail 
and this is a uh, quote that you know well, we are all caught in an inescapable mutuality, bound in a single garment of destiny. And what he was talking about, ladies and gentlemen, was the now well-worn word interdependence. Okay, wasn't well-worn back then, new idea back then, but it's part of our public discourse today, interdependence. Now here's the point I wanna make. If interdependence was the reality of 1960s America, imagine how much more so it's the reality of our hyperlinked era. First and foremost, non-Muslims need to accept that they have the permission to speak up against the abuses of human rights that happen in other countries as much as in our own. Beyond that, get involved with the Moral Courage Project by speaking to my ambassador here in Cleveland and in other parts of the country, William Green, and also speaking to our friends at the Moral Courage table. There's a lot more to be done going forward, and may I add that, again, it's not just about Islam, but by starting with Muslim reform, you can give it an anchor, and you can begin to see how you, in your own capacity, grow. Grow out of the need, the uh, paralyzing need for uh, politeness at every, you know, at every turn. I'm not asking you to be rude. I'm not asking you to play nice. I'm asking you to tell the truth. It starts and it ends with the truth. Thank you, Arshad. This has been an interesting challenge for both Americans and Muslims. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to Irshad Manji, a leading Islamic reformer, speaking in question and answer form on the subject, America and Islam, challenges ahead. We'll return to the traditional question and answer period of the City Club in a few moments, but first we have a few City Club announcements. Today, as you know, we're uh, listening to this Friday forum featuring uh, Urshad, and <clears throat> we're going to have the Q&A period as soon as I finish these announcements, and we would like you to be thinking of your questions so that they'll be well uh, stated, and remember, questions should be brief and no speeches, please. We remind you that uh, members and guests alike are welcome to attend any of our Friday forums, and we hope that people who are listening on various uh, media will join the City Club as well. We welcome all of you who are here listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or any of the many radio stations that uh, carry this broadcast across the country. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS Idea Stream, and uh, <clears throat> as I believe you know, television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. And the live webcast, as you've heard, is supported by the University of Akron. This year, 2012, the City Club turns 100 years of age, and we've got some extra special programs scheduled. Uh, to learn more about all this, uh, please turn on our website, <clears throat> tab it. We'd like to welcome guests today at uh, <clears throat> tables that have been hosted by Baker Hostetler, Jones Day, and the Moral Courage Project, and we thank all of you for your excellent support. We're also pleased to welcome students who are here as part of the City Club Normal Student Program. Participation of these students has been made possible by a very generous grant from the Charles E. Spar Charitable Trust. With us today are students from Hawkins School. And will you students from Hawkins please stand up to be recognized? <laughs> Welcome. And today is also the Aaron H. and Ruth S. Zajcik Memorial Forum, which was established by a very generous gift from the estate of Aaron and Ruth Zajcik. Joining us today at the head table is Bob Lustig, representing the family, and I might point out that Bob joined the City Club in 1964. Bob, will you please stand? 
Okay, now we'll return to our speaker for the traditional City Club Q&A period. As I said before, we welcome questions from anyone in the room, including guests, and uh, holding the microphones today are Carrie Miller over here. She's the uh, City Club Program Director. And over there, Betsy Wallace, the 100th Anniversary Assistant Director. First question, please. Ms. Manji, over here. I urge on you something that you may already be doing, which is to pick gender segregation as a lead issue. It has a special appeal to me for one obvious reason. You are a magnificent personal example of the premise that gender, gender segregation is foolish. But it also strikes me that it is an issue that resonates with every major religion, certainly Christianity, has huge gender discrimination issues. Muslim, uh, Islam does too. Uh, Judaism, particularly in the Orthodox world. Even Buddhism, I think. So I suggest it is a powerful issue for you because so many people can engage in it, engage with it, and understand it. Please comment. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that piece of advice, actually. Um, I, gender segregation, and make no mistake, it is segregation, not merely separation, is uh, mercifully an issue that more and more uh, young women and uh, men are becoming vocal about. And uh, I tell you, you know, that comes with its own uh, ruffling of feathers, of course. Um, we remember the debate at the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, or about the so-called Ground Zero Mosque in New York City. What I noticed um, about that debate is that uh, people would take sides based not on the merits of the project, but on how offended they felt by those who took an opposing view. So both pro and con became, well, conned by the culture of offense that we today live in. And I bring this up, sir, because uh, I believe that we're all more uh, capable of using our freedoms uh, for better. For example, by asking questions out loud. Questions like, will women and men at the Ground Zero Mosque be segregated at any time of the day or night? If so, and by the way, I finally got the answer to that from the imam who used to head up the project. The answer is yes, they will. If they are being segregated there, then on that merit alone, on that criterion alone, the Ground Zero Mosque should not be supported. Okay? If racial segregation is an offense and an affront to human dignity, and it is, the same must be said about gender segregation and must be eliminated in America. Hello, uh, Irshad. I wanted to ask you again about application of the Moral Courage Project to zones of conflict, particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which is frequently characterized as violent and with uh, elements of religious extremism. But do you consider uh, those uh, Israelis and Palestinians who are practicing, promoting nonviolent uh, resistance to uh, abuses of human rights and civil rights, Christians, Muslims, and Jews as uh, morally courageous? Um, the short answer, Doug, is yes. Uh, let me give you a more fleshed out answer. So back to the point about what moral courage is. It, it's not one of the mill courage. Bobby Kennedy, again, uh, emphasized that moral courage is more rare and therefore more valuable than bravery in battle or even great intelligence. Why? Because moral courage is necessarily in, incites backlash from one's own community. So those Palestinians who are resisting violent so-called solutions, and I say so-called because violence is never a solution, those Palestinians who are resisting violence in order to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict absolutely are morally courageous. Those Israelis who are calling out their own government and the elites in Israel 
uh, about the continued occupation of the West Bank are morally courageous. And now I will add that the real test of moral courage for Palestinians would be to go one step further, obviously always nonviolent, and acknowledge, Doug, that in Israel, for all of its problems, for all of its warts, and every democracy has problems and warts, in Israel, you still have the freedom to establish human rights organizations that openly criticize the Israeli government. You don't have that anywhere in the Arab world. And it's vitally important if those activists, morally courageous Palestinian activists, are to have legitimacy and credibility with the rest of the world, it's incumbent upon them to acknowledge that this is not a situation that we found in South Africa. I know the word apartheid, like the word racism, is bandied about helter-skelter these days. It is not an apartheid state. It is a deeply problematic situation that can be resolved, but that nonviolence on its own isn't going to do it. These activists also need to build their cred with the rest of the world, and one way to do it is to acknowledge where Israel is going right and what we as Muslims, particularly in the Arab world, can learn from that flawed but still functioning democracy. Uh, Irshad, welcome to the Cleveland area. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question has to do with timing. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of violence that people in the United States and all over the world have seen. And it seems like you're not supported well by the Yemens and the like. And perhaps they're intimidated. Maybe that's, you know, what it is. Okay. So my question is this. Uh, sometimes there are events that are like watershed or catalyst events. Uh, in terms of timing, do you think that you're that catalyst event, so to speak, your group starting to happen? And if you don't think that, um, how long do you think it's going to take before, you know, this uh, arrival at uh, sanity is going right. to, you know, prevail? Right. Well, let me first say you are absolutely right that the imams, the mullahs, the muftis, and the ayatollahs don't like me very much. <laughs> I wear that as a badge of honor. I don't think having popularity with those who are part of the problem would be a good thing. Um, that being said, uh, you know, when I was in Cairo in May of 2005, I observed what were then the biggest demonstrations the biggest demonstrations against the authoritarianism of the Mubarak regime. And I knew at that time and at that point that this is not the end. This is part of a process that will be realized in my lifetime. I could not have predicted to you that January uh, 2011 would have been you know, the hour of the so-called revolution's arrival. But I would have certainly said to you, and probably would have been laughed out of the room at the time, that there is something going on that we need to know about. Now, uh, you can, since I've invoked the example of the Arab Spring, let me take it one step further. Uh, you could take my example and say, yeah, well, so, so much for that revolution. Look at what's happening now. But let's remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the American Republic was born of an enlightenment mentality, and it still took more than 100 years after the American Revolution to get to the point where formal slavery could be transcended. More than 100 years. And then it took another 100 years to get to the point where a sustainable, viable movement against ra racial segregation could also be launched. So, Let's not look for big picture solutions now or tomorrow or next week. Let's look for and enable those signs that say, OK, something is going on, and I can be a part of it. And I'm going to finish off my answer to you with this story. Back to Cairo 2005. So after these major demonstrations, I hang out with a group of democracy activists at a cafe. And one of them, 
is a young Muslim woman in her 20s who approaches me and says, Irshad, I, you know, I recognize you from your CNN international interviews, and uh, I know you give advice to, to young people. I need you to help me, she said. I have fallen in love with a Jewish man. And um, I don't know how to tell my parents. She then said something even more stunning, that here I am putting my life on the line, trying to achieve political change in my country of Egypt. But the scarier thing for me is to talk to my own family about love. Seemingly simple, everyday, routine, notions that we take for granted, which are monumental in other parts of the world. So here's my last thought for you on this issue. The next time you're reading headlines, which are often quite legitimate in terms of what they're reporting, Egypt going backward, uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, rising in power, uh, secular Democrats coming out for, another ra for more rallies in Tahrir Square, Remember this young woman I told you about. She is utterly emblematic of a new generation that is struggling with change at the personal and not just the public level. And when you think about those activists, please remember that they're not merely mascots or puppets in a show for all of us. They are real human beings who are looking for change within their families and not just within their legislatures. That's how big this revolution is. And God willing and people willing in your lifetime and mine, we'll learn that this young woman married the man of her choice. I admire and value your work very much. But let me make things more complex. It see, it, because it, one of the terms, a central term you use is courage. And the, the fact is, as I see it from my work and from my reading, we're not just dealing with fear in all of us. At, in particular, let's say in this case, with the moderate Muslims, for example, we're dealing with terror. And as I see it, what you have you made an approach from the conscious side. I think there's a whole another world of mind activity going on that needs to be a, a, should be appreciated at least, whether it's focused on or not at this time is another matter. And that is, I think so many of us are dealing with the unconscious terror, not with the terror as such but with forms such as specificity, repression, uh, that is to block it off. And this involves uh, then our inability to, our difficulty, great difficulty in taking action. We don't even know how to do it, so to speak. Yeah. And so that, that's the point I really wanted to bring out, the terror that's present so many. Thank you, and I think you make a very important point, and that's why you have to read Allah, Liberty, and Love. You just have to, sir, because I deal with that very issue throughout the book. In fact, the book is organized as a series of lessons. Each chapter is a lesson that I have learned personally about how to transcend the internal or self-imposed repression to, in order to move beyond the fear that you're talking about. And one of the quick hints I will throw out at you is that I've learned in my research uh, that, um, and many psychologists are now talking about this, you can't expect, much like you can't expect a revolution to, um, to, to, to bear uh, good fruit uh, in one night or one week, so you cannot expect us as individuals and as human beings to make the leap from this internalized terror to moral courage. But what you can do is every day, or at least very frequently, establish manageable goals that will allow you uh, what one psychologist calls the small wins, the minor victories that will then add up 
to a habit of moral courage so that when it really counts, and your conscience will tell you when it really counts, I don't have to tell you that, when it really counts, you will have developed enough of that habit to display moral courage. Uh, I must tell you something else here. Folks, uh, don't, do not take the comment that this uh, gentleman made as some kind of an affirmation that, yeah, we're really not capable of it, or at least I'm not capable of it. You know, three months ago, I was in the Netherlands launching a La Liberty and Love in Amsterdam. I showed a video of this at a, in a smaller a meeting earlier today, and yesterday as it turns out, a video of what happened during my book launch. 22 violent jihadists stormed my launch, threatened me with execution, swore that they would break my neck. Two of them were arrested out of 22 that night were arrested, and the next day when the Amsterdam police um, uh, started their investigations, uh, they found a loaded Kalashnikov, a machine gun, in the home of a third man who was arrested. Now I say this to you for one reason alone. The fascinating part about the evening was not, for me, the jihadists. The fascinating part was that my guests at the book launch did not flee. Not a single of them ran from the room when they had the opportunity to. Instead, and there's a beautiful photo of this, they created a human shield around me and my Dutch Muslim co-host. The point being that when it really counts the most, ordinary people are capable of moral courage. They didn't see this coming. But they had followed my work enough to know that these are the challenges every day or frequently that they need to be giving themselves. And when it mattered, they had it. And they delivered. And we showed the jihadists that there can be unity among pluralists. It was a beautiful moment. And we resumed the event after the arrests happened. Urshad. Thank you very much for your comments. You, you tied up your initial comments by commissioning us to begin this reform by speaking the truth. Right. So my question to you, and this is going to belie my kind of relativistic young upbringing, is how do you define and how do you propose we define the truth? Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad, by the way, and thank you for acknowledging your relativistic upbringing. Uh, listen, I teach, as you know. Relativism is a huge problem among younger people. Actually, it's a huge problem throughout society. And let me explain what I mean by relativism. A relativist is somebody who falls for anything because she stands for nothing. Okay? A relativist believes it is illiberal to make judgments. And by the way, in making that judgment, the relativist has contradicted herself. Okay? I suggest that we strive to be pluralists people who do make judgments every day about what's conscionable and unconscionable, what's right or wrong, what's true and false, just as my friend Doug and, and his wife and my, my friend Marianne do when they uh, advocate for the rights, the human rights of Palestinians. They make judgments. They're not relativists. But that doesn't necessarily yet make them pluralists because pluralists, and I think they are, make their judgments with humility, acknowledging that any judgment we make has to be temporary, provisional, contingent upon having more experiences in life and hearing better arguments down the road. <laughs> Hence the importance of free speech. Hence the importance of the city club. Seriously, right? Yeah. So um, I can't even remember what your question was. Because <laughs> you know what? I'm old. <laughs> and I'm a pluralist, unlike you young relativists. <laughs> so uh, can you just remind me very quickly your question? My question was, how do, you uh, how do I define the truth? Well, there is, thank you, thank you, Carrie. There is no capital T truth except that um, we do live in a complex world. 
We each have something to learn from each other, but learning from each other does not have to mean agreeing with each other. And my final sort of comment to cap this answer off is that I, I alluded to this earlier on in the conversation with Professor Makala. Respect me, that phrase, respect me, has come to be a euphemism, has come to mean don't challenge me. No, ladies and gentlemen, uh-uh. When we avoid asking each other searching, pointed, and yes, uncomfortable questions, we wind up treating one another, at least implicitly, as infants, as children. That's not respect. That's disrespect. And that's also, I will add, dishonest diversity. And I'll leave you on that point. Today, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a regular Friday forum featuring Hershad Manji, the director of the Moral Courage Project. We thank you, Hershad. We thank you, Lee McAuliffe. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.